My name is Glenn O'Bear. I'm the RDI director at Exacto, and I'm here today with Dr. Brian Young from Purdue University. Uh, thanks for joining us, Brian. Well, thank you for the invite, Glenn. I'm looking forward to the conversation today. Yeah, same here. So can you tell me a little bit about your background in weed science and, and then kind of get into your program today at Purdue? Um, what's your group working on? What does your program look like in terms of projects and the geography that you guys cover? Sure, just briefly on myself. So I grew up on a, a grain farm in Michigan. Sugar beets and dry edible beans were the common ones, so not your most typical cash crops, I guess, uh, for the U.S. in general. Uh, I guess you could say I was inspired by weed science, by hand weeding a lot during my early years there. I went to Michigan State, uh, studied under uh, Dr. Don Penner, who is kind of an icon in the adjuvant industry. Uh, but I worked with him as an undergrad for four years, went to graduate school at the University of Illinois, uh, with another individual, Steve Hart, who did a lot of work in adjuvant research and application technology. And then from there, I got my uh, PhD at University of Illinois and then entered the professional ranks, finally with my first real job, which happened to be at Southern Illinois University in 1998 as a faculty member in weed science doing research, teaching, and some outreach. And then in 2013, I joined Purdue University in the same role. Uh, academics mostly focused on research and uh, teaching, but also still continue to do a lot of outreach activity. So that's my background. Um, so I have a passion for agriculture, production agriculture, uh, dabbled a little bit in animal science and took uh, hogs to the fair and everything, but plants would be my passion. Uh, and, you know, for my research, I develop a lot of things that I have academic interest in terms of plant physiology and how herbicides might be working or the biology of weed and what makes it so difficult to manage. But I tie that together with some practical outcome, because in the end, I want to be able to help a farmer uh, because I know I'd be frustrated if I had to go hand weed. And that's my only alternative. So that kind of motivates me production agriculture, because you know, I want to be able to help a farmer because I do have a very small farm that I have as well, just to uh, say that I have, uh, you know, tractors and combines and things like that. So I want to stay grounded in my research. Um, so if you want me to talk a little bit about some of the research projects we have right now at Purdue University, one, I would say that uh, we have a very team oriented weed science group. There's myself and Bill Johnson are the primary weed scientists that do work in field crops. And in Indiana, that would be corn and soybeans with a little bit of wheat. Um, but we co-advise a lot of students. We share space and equipment resources to the point where, you know, to the outsider, it would be unknown what I do versus what Bill does. And that can be fine. You know, we have no problem with that. Um, but overall in the program, we have a lot of students working on herbicide resistance, understanding some of the resistance mechanisms, such as glyphosate resistance in giant ragweed, uh, PPO resistance in water hemp and palmer amaranth, uh, giant ragweed resistance to ALS inhibiting herbicides, which isn't anything new, uh, but it continues to be a challenge. And we uh, have found some recent uh, information about why uh, ALS resistance in giant ragweed is inherited a certain way. Uh, so herbicide resistance, not just understanding that resistance mechanism, uh, but also management. What tools do we have available to better manage it? And that could be other herbicide modes of action. It could be just applying your herbicides better, more optimally than what we have in the past. That could be uh, growth stage, pre versus post. Um, also introducing non-chemical forms. You know, last year we did a trial with weed electrocution and uh, we did some row cultivation. We're also looking at uh, things such as uh, spray, sensors that might be on spray booms uh, to see how that might uh, improve weed management in what we would call, I guess, commercially a sea and spray, which is John Deere, Blue River specific, uh, but Obviously, there's going to be other players in that market in the future to see if that's a, a better way to apply herbicides to address some of the resistance concerns. Um, along those application parameters, uh, we also have a student working on the potential to use variable rate application technology for soil residual herbicides. We've done variable rate applications of fertilizers, maybe even some other ag chemicals. But 
soil residual herbicides are a key component of resistance management today. Yet one of the biggest pushbacks we get is, well, one, it might be cost. Number two, it might be, I think it injures my crop, especially in soybeans when we talk about uh, sulfentrazone or authority type products, or maybe safflophenicol sharpen, or maybe flumioxazine and valor. Um, so there's some pushback, and those are some important herbicides for residual control of these amaranthus species that we're trying to combat. So if we could avoid the high rates on the coarse textured soils, the lighter soils where we might get crop response and make sure we have a high enough rate on the darker soils, typically some of the lower areas with higher organic matter, maybe a little bit more clay, poorly drained, uh, maybe we can optimize the use of these residual herbicides and not just use a blanket rate across the entire field and hope for the best, but always have escapes. At least that's been the experience I've heard talking with growers who've been frustrated and some applicators who are frustrated. Um, another component that a lot of people are working on, we have a, a student or a couple of students working on auxin herbicides, 2,4-D and dicamba, potential for off-target movement, uh, volatility, more so in the case of dicamba than 2,4-D, but um, what factors influence volatility? How can that be managed better? Uh, we know that dew is involved with volatility and injury on soybeans. What is what is it about that dew? What is the dew on soybeans influencing? Is it the volatility process in general, or is it how sensitive the soybean crop might be because it has dew on the leaf surface? So we're trying to sort out some of the underlying factors that uh, we just don't push under the rug and say dicamba off target movement is bad, but use this as a point of, of learning so that we don't repeat the same problem with another herbicide in the future. Um, we also have some trials looking at uh, soybean resiliency, if we can call, to herbicide applications that might be to off-target movement of dicamba, where we see a pretty large response in one soybean variety's uh, response to the same amount of dicamba herbicide uh, compared to another soybean variety. And similar research to the PPO inhibiting herbicides that are soil applied. I already mentioned sulfentrazone and safflophenicol, Sharpen and Authority products. Um, there's a huge range in genetic capacity to tolerate those herbicides in soybean germplasm. Do we see that commercially available in soybean lines? No. Um, we see a fraction of that, but not the full range in response. Of course, they've tried to take out those that are extremely sensitive but in our research, we've seen some that are a lot more tolerant to what is commercially available too. So there's excitement there about what we might be able to bring forward. So I think that covers most of the areas, Glenn, that we're doing research on. Uh, maybe I didn't focus enough on, Bill Johnson is also working on cover crops and row cultivation, so non-chemical forms of weed control, and I've let him uh, migrate to that area, and I've been focusing more on the herbicide-centric aspects of the off-target movement, soybean resiliency, and application technology. Got it. So a, a general question then, you know, across all those projects you mentioned, there are aspects that are, you know, really founded in the basic science, like the weed physiology and, and that kind of thing. Uh, at the other end, there's, um, you know, what does it mean to some, somebody as an end user? And then there's ac academic Parts, uh, collaborators in that, as well as, as industry, like the people making some of the equipment that goes into that. Can you talk about, you know, when, when you're doing these projects and coming up with conclusions, like how does that ultimately um, get into, uh, into an applied practice, maybe for a grower or, or feed into a recommendation that's actionable, you know, and how yeah. do those different players kind of work together, industry, research, and, and uh, end users? Yeah, it, it can be a balancing act at different points if there's anything that's a sensitive issue because you have to make sure that uh, you state the facts clearly and you don't over extrapolate the data uh, that, uh, you know, your conclusions and recommendations are based solely on what you observed in the research. Um, but for some projects that can happen uh, somewhat naturally because they're fairly applied in nature. Um, such as, you know, off-target movement or herbicides and potential, you know, dicamba versus 2,4-D. Well, you know, here's what we observed. Um, the newer formulation of 2,4-D, the enlist formulation, choline, 
uh, we don't seem to have as many problems on soybean because they're just more tolerant to soybean at the same use rate as what dicamba uh, would be. So some of it's a lot easier. Uh, we've had other students that have worked with experimental herbicides from a company um, that have potential activity on current herbicide resistance forms in water hemp. And that one you have to uh, you know, acknowledge that we have limited research. It's not like we've applied this on several thousand acres. So this, what we have observed in our research is gonna to translate to every soybean farmer state of Indiana or in the Midwest. Um, you have to you know, make sure that you qualify that. This is what we've seen so far and has exciting potential. Uh, but you know, it's not until you use it on a couple of hundred thousand acres that you understand what some of the problems and challenges might be with use, utilizing it to solve a certain commercial problem. Um, <clears throat> so really have to control our excitement in a lot of cases before we relay this to uh, solving commercial problems, because again, research that we do, you know, in the greenhouse, in a lab, or even in a small plot field trial doesn't always translate to what can happen on millions of acres. And so it's really guarded how we have to be. And that's what we uh, tell a lot of our students when they get a result, they're excited about it. And, you know, they'll write a conclusion in their abstract that says, you know, this could solve all PPO resistant water hemp issues today in soybean. Like, I, I don't think we want to make that blanket of a statement. Let, let's go ahead and ratchet that back a little bit to, you know, this has potential because this is what it can do in research. And how can we take advantage of that? Um, so I think that's be the biggest challenge is making sure that we stay within the confines of our research and don't over extrapolate the potential results. Yeah, that makes sense. What about uh, projects where you work with multiple institutions? Uh, how much of that do you do where you're running similar concepts across different states, different universities? Well, so one thing that uh, I'm involved with, I, I lead a United Soybean Board project, which has I'm just going to say 12 different universities involved. And in some cases, we'll all be conducting the same research. In other cases, maybe just maybe five or six out of the 12 will be doing one component. Another five or six might be doing another component. So together, we have this team approach that we're addressing all these different objectives. But each of us might not be involved with every objective. Um, so working in that environment effectively is to understand who's going to lead all these different tasks um, when it comes to who is going to be in charge of the messaging that comes out of it. I think it's important because you can have a lot of different people look at the same results and they have different takeaways. And a consistent message is best uh, in this type of platform where you're saying, here's research conducted uh, with funds through United Soybean Board. And here's our, our uniform message. Because if you have investigators with different messages from their same research, well, that just looks like we don't know what we're talking about. Uh, because we, we obviously don't agree on what the most important things are. So just understanding who the leaders are, providing input as a team. Um, and that goes into developing the protocol, but also on the back end, after you have the data interpreting those results and what type of messaging needs to go to the clientele. Um, so that's one balancing act with United Soybean Board, uh, various states involved, different universities. When it comes to industry, uh, that one gets a little bit more difficult because industry doesn't like to talk to each other that much. Um, you know, they're, they're competitors. And so I, I understand that. So, it's like we take a little bit of information from each company and their comfort level is what they're willing to share, what they accept as being public knowledge and uh, what their goals are. So you try to identify commonalities between the different cooperators you have in industry. And then as long as you limit it to those areas, I think you can be on the safe side. You know, there's where we're headed as a group and here's where we want to go and here's what we need to get done to get there. Um, that's how you can be safe. Where you get into trouble is when you talk about anything too specific to a company and um, it almost feels like you might be targeting them. And even if it's a positive thing, like well, this technology is great, uh, one of the other companies that are competing, 
uh, don't appreciate that message because they might have something that's good too. You're just not familiar with it. But as being a unbiased voice, United University, you have to be concerned about, are you playing favorites by talking about one company's technology and saying it's great and not another company's? So you have to, again, be guarded in how you approach that. But the safe area would be where are we headed with this technology? Let's just pick on the uh, the weed sensing technology we might have on spray booms commercially, like that John Deere has already launched with CN Spray. Um, you know, we want to get to the point where we're more accurate at site-specific weed management through liquid applications. And that means, you know, herbicides, chemical weed control. And how is that going to impact the market? What benefit does that have towards weed management or resistance management? Um, I think that's, those are the safe areas, you know, the common goals. Yeah, that totally makes sense. And yeah, you know, we're, we are a company, we're on the industry side, but um, it's, it's kind of ironic, you know, it's, uh, we don't always talk to each other, but all of our stuff's going in the same tank and going through equipment. I mean, the whole system that a grower is using is all these different people. And if they don't talk to each other, then, uh, you know, lots of problems can arise. So it's, that's, I think that's our biggest challenge going forward is integrating all these different systems that, um, that can compete with each other. <laughs> You know, for example, uh, like our, our drift reduction adjuvants compete with the TTI nozzle or, or vice versa, but we need to know how the, those things work together because they will be used together like we see with Dicamba. So it's, um, right. yeah, and I think we always try to take the approach of um, what is the scientific question being asked? And, and I think if you pull back the veil on the companies and the names and the brands and all that stuff, and you just get to what science are we doing here? Um, that's the common language I, I hope that we can all speak. So, right. Yeah. There is some point of frustration where, you know, internally companies have all this information and they probably know more about PPO resistance than what's been shared in the public forum. Uh, you know, some companies done, done a lot of research, but they're not going to publish that because there might be some intellectual property there that they want to utilize for something else. And they're not disclosing all that, but it'd be a great benefit to have access to that. And so I see that when working with companies A, B, and C, and they all have similar technology. And I could, if I could just pick, you know, this aspect from company A and this aspect from B and this one from C, all total, we'd have a better product. Uh, but we know that's not gonna happen that way um, because at the end, they have to have an advantage. They're not looking for marketing agreements. Maybe that's the future, more marketing agreements, uh, developing technologies together. Um, but that requires a lot of disclosures and a lot of discomfort. But I, I think we're seeing a little bit more disclosures happening and more company agreements now than, let's say, 20 years ago. That's my perception, at least. Uh, we're not informed of who has all these agreements, but uh, I, I think that's taking place. Hopefully, if, you know, if the solutions truly solve the problems better or help end users better, then uh, hopefully the balances of the universe would would tend tilt towards that direction, right? Towards right. solutions that, that are better. Well, you would think that the best technology that they, you know, provide a benefit, that's what growers are willing to pay for, that's going to come to market. And by the time they all get to market, you know, somebody's going to identify that, boy, these things in combination are going to work out very well. Or you might have a technology that would be adopted even faster if you partnered with another company and what they have too. So uh, it does happen maybe not early enough. You like it on the early development side, but uh, that's the way it is. You know, it is a capitalistic society. Yeah, true. Uh, the other layer in here that we haven't discussed is also uh, how, how these companies work with regulatory bodies. Uh, we, we, we primarily produce adjuvants, which are a lot more straightforward than, than active ingredients, for example. So, you know, um, the, the data packages required by EPA or by the regulatory bodies um, in to a large extent, probably drive what can and will be shared and, and you know, drive the, the research. And so I guess my only point is um, that, you know, in addition to the end user needs, uh, you know, academic research industry, then we also have that regulatory piece that if we're not all on the same page, it makes things really challenging. But best case, hopefully all of those initiatives kind of align. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, uh, you know, when I really appreciate my university job and not being in industry is when talking about regulatory issues, frankly, uh, because to develop a new herbicide product uh, and have the vision for what regulatory is going to require 10 years from now, um, 
I don't know how they do that. Uh, I don't know how to function in that. A moving target is something I would not be good at. Um, uh, but that's what industry is. You have to forecast what the, what the regulatory environment is going to be, you know, at least five to eight years from now to know what might be a, a red flag. And that's very difficult to know. You know, the only thing safe now is, well, you, you know darn well that endangered species is going to be an issue five to eight years from now because it's just starting to um, have a major impact now. It's always had an impact, but now, you know, I, I, I hear about how every, you know, regulatory decision is going to be driven more by some of these endangered species issues uh, that we've seen on some of the enlist labeling as of late, uh, just in the last uh, six months. Yeah. Yeah, and from our perspective, from our side, um, you know, we're active in groups like CPDA who work together, and so that's an example where maybe we are competitors, but we're all getting together and trying to to see that forecast in the future and and try to be prepared for those types of changes. And then we've also found, you know, um, I know it's it can be tricky to predict the future, but uh, most of the time, picking up the phone and and talking to the regulator uh, is really helpful. And those people are, are really, uh, supportive and telling us what they need for the most part. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's good people behind all of the, these different layers. We just have to work together. Right. Right. Yeah. One tricky thing with the regulatory issue is, you know, you, you think about, well, the academic group and maybe professional societies can separate themselves from the private industry. But if you think about our weed science society of America, well, about half the membership works for private industry. So when we are asked from the EPA to provide input on something, you know, how do you define a resistant weed? Or uh, how do you measure off-target movement? Well, some could be concerned about that. Well, your membership is composed of private industry, so it's by a system. You know, do we truly have a, a professional society that is unbiased in terms of product development and re regulatory issues? So we don't have one that's just made up of, you know, non-private industry individuals. You know, we have the Weed Science Society of America. And I don't know how that really reflects compared to the Phytopass Society. Um, you know, if they have as much industry involvement, I think they do. Uh, but, you know, I think moving forward, if we want the EPA to continue to rely on, on scientists in weed science, you know, to be very frank, you know, is that Weed Science Society of America that has private industry involved, or is that going to be considered a red flag eight years from now? That they, they will no longer consult with WSSA because of the membership. That's a concern I have. Yeah, it's a fair question. I think the certainly, at the very least, we need that balance of, um, you know, different constituents with different stakeholders, I guess. And then, uh, and then you know, there's bias every person has bias, right? Just based on all the different types of biases that are out there. So uh, it's it's a great call out though, to, to make sure that that's always kind of at the forefront, right? Well, it, we've, we've already been mindful of it when um, we've been asked to, or maybe it's be prudent for WSSA to comment on something that is being considered at the regulatory level. If our current president of WSSA is a Syngenta employee, can we comment about atrazine registration, you know, and have their name on it? That would seem to be a conflict. And so we've, we've had those issues already, and I don't think it's going to get any easier for us, frankly. Yeah, definitely a challenge to work through for sure. Yeah. Um, so just thinking ahead now, so um, you talked about a lot of the, the challenges that you guys are working on, and it's refreshing, you know, the past <laughs> few years at weed science conferences, especially going back a few years, 98% uh, of the topics were just dicamba. That was it. <laughs> and my, that's, that was my opinion, at least. Um, and, and but, you know, you highlighted so many things that your program's working on in addition to that. And uh, now I'm, I'm just thinking ahead, you know, um, as, as we kind of move out of that, that huge uh, surge of, of work that was going around the launch of dicamba, but now to what's next and, and what are the, some of the challenges that we'll be working through in the next few years and then kind of further out, you know, what's, what's your program going to look like in 10 years? Um, what challenges will we be facing? Well, I, I think we've been, we've been very fortunate that we've focused so much on herbicides and been so effective for so many decades 
um, that we've been dug in, you know, to this hole of, that makes it sound bad, this focus area of herbicides, very herbicide centric. And that's how we achieve weed management. And commercially, that's how it's done. Um, but, you know, I talked about a lot of different things that we're going to have to start integrating cover crops, cultural practices, row spacing, uh, weed electrocution, maybe um, lasers. I know they're doing work on lasers, energy for, you know, killing weeds. I think 10 years from now, we're going to have a much more integrated research program because you can't look at just herbicides in a vacuum anymore. It's how do they work within the overall program? If you're looking at a grower solution, it's a program approach. Now, there can be different components within there that you pick out, okay, I'm going to focus on this herbicide aspect, but we're also doing two other things to manage weeds besides herbicides. Uh, but I think there's going to be a lot more that look at the overall integrated approach. And what's exciting about that is when we did research 20 years ago, and this saddens me some, but you know, not too many people were calling for the answers. Uh, you know, what does your research say? Well, our research included glyphosate, Roundup, and it was working for everybody for the most part, except on some horse weed or mare's tail out in certain regions. Uh, so you became a little bit lonely, but that was, uh, you know, the, the silver bullet that solved a lot of weed management issues. But now that we need to move towards more of a diverse system uh, for resistance management, it becomes a lot more localized. Well, it's not just cover crop, but what cover crop works in your area and when do you terminate it in your area, considering when you want to plant your corn or your soybean. Um, and then what herbicides can you use if you plan to uh, plant a cover crop in the fall and not have carryover concerns? Um, what row spacings might be more common to your geography versus others? You know, if you tell somebody in the Mid-South they need to narrow up their rows from 38 inches wide, uh, I don't think that's going to happen too quickly. It'd be, you can have that conversation here in the Midwest, uh, but not in other areas. So I think what's interesting is the management systems in the future isn't a one-size-fits-all situation. Uh, so we become needed again. Uh, unique, and you adapt it to the local geography, whether it's the herbicide or the non-chemical methods that are being used. So we get back to having some regional importance, uh, which is good for me, you know, makes me feel good. But also, I think we can have more robust systems because I actually round up on every acre in the U.S. wasn't robust for too long. Um, it still contributes a lot towards weed control, but it's not the only answer anymore. So that's the exciting thing, the integrated aspects that will be a focal point of all projects 10 years from now, I think. Yeah, that's exciting and that does make sense. Uh, what do you think about, you know, thinking about weed science programs and, and kind of university support? Um, do you see, the, you know, what trends do you see there? Do you think that there'll be the same number of programs and students, uh, more, less? What does that look like? Well, um, over the last two months, I've been really disturbed in a, in a negative way about uh, really grad student candidates. They just aren't out there like they used to be. And I've I had an email to some colleagues saying, you know, the days of finding the farm kid who's not gonna go back to the farm, but wants to be in agriculture, finding them as a bachelor's student that wants to go to graduate school, good luck finding that student anymore. It's harder and harder to find those. And right now, industry is hiring a lot of people and masters and you'll gain experience with us or you get an online degree, you know, online, great. Um, I have opinions on that, but won't share it during this blog. <laughs> but we're finding more difficult. So for many years, we've also had, well, this is a rural kid or somebody with farm experience, farming area, and they understand agriculture and production agriculture and their graduate students. Now, frankly, um, I'm talking to students with no farm experience. And my concern is, are they going to have the passion for agriculture like some of these other students have been that grew up in agriculture? So it's one thing to give them the passion uh, to get a degree in there, but you know, when they move on to industry or academia, do they continue on with their passion in agriculture or does it just become a, an academic exercise, you know, because I need publications. That's, that's my job. Is it solving 
farmer's problem about killing a weed uh, two counties north of here? No, uh, that's never been who I am. I'm about doing this research. Uh, so I'm going to do this experiment that's very focused on uh, getting publications, getting grants, and that fills out my metrics for my annual review. Done. Uh, it's not necessarily having an impact at the grower level. It's having an impact on the scholarship, which doesn't always translate to the grower level and production ag. So I have that concern. And then if you think about it, uh, you know, what's disturbing, I've heard a lot of industry where they're, I had, I had an undergrad talk to me this week and they stated that they're accepting a job with industry. It's research oriented. And I said, don't you need a graduate degree? No, they said that I can just do an online degree while being full-time employed. Like, well, are you really going to learn or appreciate the research uh, experimental method uh, in an online degree that you learn actually doing a resident, you know, graduate degree? Um, are you going to learn about the research that others are doing in that group, in that field of weed science or crop protection at that university by doing an online degree in your office uh, at your home? Uh, is that really going to be the same? And so if these individuals are then moving up the chain in industry, how does that impact research and discovery in the future? Um, so I have some concerns about where we're headed right now, frankly, in terms of uh, having enough students, we're, we're part of the supply chain problem right now. Uh, I, I don't have enough grad students. A year from now, I haven't accepted any graduate student that'll be starting within the next year. I might, uh, but if I don't, I'll have zero graduate students a year from now because mine will be graduated. So yeah. that's not just me. I've talked to other colleagues across the US and it's just more of a challenge to recruit good graduate students right now. Um, I've, I've gone towards, um, you know, international students. Mm -hmm. There, there's an interest. Um, so the, the future concerns me a little bit in terms of the pipeline of, of you know, human capital, talent. Um, and, you know, when we talked about recruiting non, from non-ag areas, non-rural areas to bring students from cities into agriculture, you know, to me, that's always been kind of a distant thing. Like, no, there's enough ag kids that, you know, always have those students in class to talk to and those to train. But now that's probably where I'm going to go for my graduate students. So it's a real issue for me. Yeah, I, I came from the field of turf grass management. And uh, so there have been similar dec declines there. I think partly due to some industry trends in that field, but you know, the cost of four-year degrees has, has increased and um, it, it's just, it's been challenging to, to have that pipeline maintained. But, you know, I ha haven't gone through that myself. Uh, and it's, it's not even the, it's, it's a big part of what classes you take and what's kind of what you did on paper, but the best learning experiences were, you know, the harebrained idea you had that uh, most likely didn't work out, but what you learned from that, <laughs> and you know, uh, or or maybe uh, you tried one thing and uh, something totally unexpected happened, and you noticed it, and then you'll remember it for the rest of your life, and uh, right. and then just kind of seeing what that means, you know, uh, in, a, in uh, on real soil in a real field, um, just it's that, it's that intangible part I think of uh, the community that community that you build, and then those those mental connections you make just by um, by being in those programs, I think is, is invaluable. It's hard to, hard to, you know, quantify that. But yeah. 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 Um, you know, a good thing for some is that Frito-Lay, uh, chip manufacturer, they're, they're paying $85,000 a year to run their trucks. Um, so it's tough to compete when you talk to somebody in high school that know you need to go get your bachelor's degree. They need to get your master's degree and you might start out at 85,000. Well, they can do that, you know, out of high school working for Frito Lay. So, how do you compete? Um, I don't know. Hopefully, they have to have a passion for production ag to go that distance. Frankly, yeah, definitely. Well, it's definitely important that we don't lose that passion, and uh, that's yeah. So, I think that's a, a good call out for for all of us who need to work together and remember why we're doing it. And uh, it, yeah, if you can connect it to that, your you know your passion or that you're you're helping somebody. Um, that's really what it comes down to. So yeah, it's not about getting a paper or getting, a, you know, <laughs> an award or something. It's about helping someone 
produce better or uh, or have a better livelihood. I think so. Yeah. Um, exactly. Yeah, I think that's the common ground that I hope all of us can come to, whether we're competitors or collaborators or or any of that. So. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, that's that's all I had. So thank you for joining us and and uh, great discussion. It's, it's always fun connecting with you and talking with you and appreciate appreciate your perspective. All right, well, thank you, Glenn. Maybe next time you're the one who gets interviewed. <laughs> I'm up for it. Let's do it. <laughs> Sounds good. All right, thank you for your time. Mm-hmm.